கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா Namaste and <laughs> welcome to another episode of this wonderful Ananya Bhakti. <laughs> I am so happy. I mean, I'm so happy. I, I can barely get it together to do this video. <laughs> no, I haven't been taking any drugs. <laughs> But I've been in meditation uh, a lot over the last few days. I have some favorable transits, so I'm taking full advantage, <laughs> transiting sun, uh, trine, natal moon. So you might want to look for that and uh, take a few days off. <laughs> but what is so wonderful is that at a certain point in the practice, the self takes over. It becomes spontaneous. And just the smallest preparation, the, just, you know, light a candle and some incense, sit down, take a couple of breaths, and boom, blown away. I used that title for this episode because uh, it pretty much describes how I feel. I'm so blown away. My mind, my ego, all that is so blown away. Like, and also it's rainy season and it actually is gusty and windy. <laughs> But blown away in the sense of being like overwhelmed by the ecstasy of it all, by the beauty of transcendental love for the self. So, you know, I have this whole series scripted out <laughs> based on talks that Michael James had with Sadhu Om about Ramana's teaching. And, but to get into all that and follow the script and everything is just like, it's too much, man. <laughs> I'm just too blown away. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just going to improvise here. But uh, blown away, <laughs> I first came in contact with that term uh, in the early 1960s. In amongst uh, jazz musicians. Uh, people don't know this, but the old time jazz musicians before the hippies and before uh, taking acid and all that, they were using terms like blown away and uh, bho. Bho is a term the Buddhist monks use to. It's an affectionate, like brotherly term. Hey, bo, right? In fact, hobos use that term up to today because in those days there were many hobos uh, who had background in Buddhism. Many people who worked on the railroad, the, ra the early railroads in the U.S. were Chinese and Japanese and had a Buddhist background. And they would call each other bo. And they were, became the first... Bindle stiffs, uh, the first railway hobos. So they used to have a tradition of calling one another Bo. And uh, in fact, even today, yeah, they refer to each other as Bows, although they don't know what it means. But the early jazz musicians, the beboppers, used to read a lot of Buddhist literature especially Suzuki, who was pretty much the first one to come out with popular books in the West. But even earlier, 
translations of the sutras. And even though they were like academic translations and so on, they transmitted a certain flavor. And one of the words or phrases used very often in them is blown away. The Buddha liked it. Uh, so he used to talk about uh, a monk who meditates rightly has all his impurities blown away. In other words, he doesn't exactly try to get rid of the impurities, but if he meditates in the right way, the impurities blow away all by themselves. Uh, just like if you leave a robe outside on a windy day, it can blow away. And this is one of the similes given in the Buddhist scriptures. So the hipsters, huh? the early 60s and late 50s hipsters were using Buddhist terms like blown away. And then, of course, when LSD got out of hand, <laughs> people were using it regularly because it certainly describes what happens to the ego and the mental structures when you take it. So a lot of people got blown away. <laughs> And, uh, I mean, really, it's the perfect phrase to describe it because you're not doing anything. Huh? Or you maybe you're doing a little something or other, but it's not about that. It's just about a little concentration, a little focusing, uh, maybe a little devotional orientation towards one's favorite deity or whatever. And then, boom, <laughs> you get blown away. So uh, this is really very pleasant. <laughs> and uh, it's not very useful <laughs> for anything, though. Uh, like I said, I, I really don't have much taste for working with technology or working with uh, words or the mind, uh, following plans and, and uh, strategies and stuff. <laughs> so I can understand why, you know, this teaching is kind of uh, not very well known because the people who succeed in it become very blown away. <laughs> Just laid back and like, whatever, man. Yeah, great. Wow, blown away. <laughs> so, uh, and it's much cheaper than drugs. <laughs> and it's also, uh, I think it's uh, permanent. I mean, as far as I can tell, <laughs> as long as they don't change anything. But, you know, uh, what can I say about my own practice? Because it's very very uh, idiosyncratic. It's very individual and very much customized to my own background and uh, preferences and like that. And everybody's practice should be like that. It's not like we can, you know, put on a little cloth underwear and walk around and be like Ramana. You know, that's, that's not going to work. Uh, to imitate someone else's success is from in this uh, practice is a fall down because each of us is unique you know each of us has our own way of approaching God and some people are going to get the uh, Arunachala Shiva as a deity and some people aren't some people are going to understand uh, Ramana's teaching, but a lot of people aren't going to get it uh, because his teaching is a particular style. It comes from a rather little known culture, the South Indian Shaivite Advaita culture. So, you know, this is not a well known culture in the West. In the West, the whole effort of the government, the schools, 
the religion, the culture in general, is to build up the ego. And here, we're trying to undermine the ego <laughs> so it can be blown away. <laughs> So we're going actually in the opposite direction, <laughs> completely opposite direction. And of course, uh, now the government is run by a supreme egotist who, you know, doesn't want to listen to anybody or follow any rules or anything except his own impulses. Uh, and of course, that's been giving a lot of energy and uh, validation to other egotists with extreme and very negative uh, viewpoints. Uh, so unfortunately, it's a step backwards. But, you know, I was just reading that 50% of Americans, according to one study, have had some kind of ecstatic experience, whether it's through drugs or like one guy was skiing and had a really bad skiing accident. And as he was lying there waiting for the, the guys to medevac him out of the, of the ski area, uh, he was in bliss. <laughs> so sometimes it comes as a shock. Uh, other times it comes as the result of a long cultivation of practice. And of course, I've been practicing, I've been re at least reaching toward some kind of transcendent experience since I was three years old. I remember very clearly sitting in the church on Easter week and, and seeing that famous stained glass picture of Jesus in the garden praying and the light is coming down you know, on his face and I'm going, he's talking with God. I want to do that. <laughs> I want to talk with God. I'm going to do it. That's what I was thinking when I was three years old. Now, who can teach me? So I spent the next 13, 14 years looking for a teacher. And I finally found my Adi Guru, Prabhupada. And he got me started on the path. He, he got me into karma yoga and uh, bhakti yoga. And then later on, of course, I... Uh, went into Tantra and Buddhism. I learned the Raja Yoga, which is taught in that discipline. And then finally, after reaching, as going as far as I could go with that, I came to Jnana Yoga and Ramana's teaching. And now I have to say, I'm just totally blown away. <laughs> I'm really, really happy. I might not get much done. <laughs> But uh, I've never been so absolutely stunningly happy in my whole life. And, and you can too. You can do this. Anyone can. Because we are all emanations from the self. Uh, every single one of us. Every conscious being. Even dogs and cats and cows and birds. <laughs> They can also realize the self. I've known a lot of cats who were pretty good meditators. <laughs> so look, it's like this. Uh, somehow or other, you have to find someone who can show you this path. I don't mean just by precept, you know, by teaching, by words, but by example, by showing you, sharing with you a way of life that leads to this self-realization, uh, abiding in the self. That's all I've been doing lately, and that's all I want to do, uh, ever. Now, once you taste it, you know, I have to say it's a bit addictive. It's like you don't want to come out of it, even to you know, get on the camera and talk with your friends. <laughs> but... Uh, after a long life of research and discipline, experimentation, and a lot of failures, <laughs> and start over again from scratch, uh, I think I finally got the formula that works. And 
you know, it's hard to express it in a general way. I could express it in a very personal and specific way, but that would only apply to me. It wouldn't necessarily apply to you. You have to find what form of God you're comfortable approaching. And then you have to approach God in that way, uh, according to your resources and your inner strengths and so on. But you know, the, oh, I wanted to say that the expression blown away comes from the refinement of metals, silver and gold especially. Um, when you refine silver and gold, in the old days, what they would do, they would put the ore on a, a tilted stone and grind it until it was very, until it was powder. And then they would wash it again and again and again. And of course, silver and gold are heavier than most minerals. And so the, the dust and uh, the pebbles and all the uh, non-metallic rocks would wash away and only the silver or gold dust would be left. But even that is still contaminated. So they would put it in a, a, a crucible and heat it. <laughs> Starting to get the uh, metaphor. They would put the, the gold particles, silver, in a, in a chalice, huh? a, uh, a little clay cylinder and then put it on a hot fire and blow air over the top. And again, the silver and gold would go to the bottom and the impurities would rise to the top where they would be blown away by the refiner's bellows. So that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, we're going into the fire. We're going into the crucible of sadhana. And sadhana, of course, heats. It increases the energy level of all the chakras. And according to the approach that we are uh, best suited for, that could be based on the heart in bhakti yoga. It could be based on service, the third chakra, karma yoga. It could be based on mantras, Chanting, the throat chakra, fourth, one, two, three, four, fifth chakra. <laughs> it could be based on meditation in the sixth chakra. Uh, and finally, ultimately, whatever base we choose, we're able to reach up and connect with the seventh chakra, the Sahasrara chakra. And that's when the ecstasy comes. That's when all the impurities are blown away. That's when the uh, base metal shines forth from below, the substrate, which is the self of all, and is totally ecstatic, which is blown away. <laughs> Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Om. Karunar Navamai Karadakadinalgum Aruna Chalashivam Yida